Torch Trust, Sight Loss 101, in conversation with Matthew Horsepool. Hello and welcome to Sight Loss 101. I have Matthew Horsepool with me today. Um, and this podcast is all about, uh, for me as a sighted person and the chief exec of a of a charity that's for blind and partially sighted people, trying to understand what it's like to live in the shoes of those who live every day with sight loss. So Matthew, welcome to this. It's wonderful to have you. Uh, Matthew is uh, one of our star members of staff in Torch. Wonderful to have folks within the organization who have different levels of sight loss. And Matthew, I understand that you've been blind since birth. Is that right? Tell us a little bit of your story, your journey um, of blindness. Yeah, well, uh, it's a journey that I can only tell secondhand, really, because I can't really remember it. Um, I was I was born blind and therefore don't know any different, uh, at least not, you know, uh, not other than intellectually. I know that I'm different. I know that I can't see and other people can, but I don't really have an understanding of what that means in a, you know, in a proper sense. Um, but yeah, I was born blind. Apparently, uh, my mum and dad noticed that things weren't quite right. Apparently, my eyes weren't opening properly. I mean, they still don't, you know, that they're a bit too small for that. Um, have bilateral microphthalmia and coloboma, which are apparently quite rare conditions. But anyway, um, yeah, my eyes didn't open properly and apparently they were told, oh, well, it's just babies. You know, they don't open their eyes, do they? And um, they kept protesting. My mum was an NHS nurse at the time and I think had a, a, an instinctive understanding that something was a bit wrong, but didn't really want to, you know, go any further with that on her own. And eventually uh, I got referred to a doctor I think who who said yes actually there is something wrong and ended up in an, in an eye hospital and uh, was registered blind I think yeah October 92 and I was born in February 92 and I still have a copy of the BD8 registration form dated I think the 10th of October 1992 which has my registration information on it. Wow and, and so then growing up obviously you never had sight how did how did you sort of become aware of being different and what that meant for you? I don't know. That's a really hard question um, because I've always sort of felt normal and for as long as I can remember. And I've always sort of known that that's actually not quite right. And I don't really know what happened, but I suppose I went to a school for the blind um, from a very early age, I went to, you know, nursery for the blind and, and carried on all the way through primary and secondary school and even into further education. And that school took blind people and partially sighted people. Mm -hmm. And what happened in the early part of primary school, you know, when I was about four or five, we used to have to, you know, uh, cross the road from one side of the campus to the other and things like, you know, go on, on school field trips and stuff like that. And um, the, the blind students were expected to partner up with partially sighted students. So the partially sighted students would guide the blind students. Wow. And uh, I'm not convinced this was a really effective way to do things because what it actually did was say, well, yes, the partially sighted people can see and you can't. It was a very, I, I suppose it was just normal because that's what always happened. But I suppose that was probably the first time when I realized that actually some of my friends could uh could be a partner uh, you know it could be the, the more equal partner if you like and you know they could guide me but i couldn't guide them wow um and then matthew through obviously you went to school continued through school and and um onto university is that right did that happen straight away basically i i, I didn't really want to go to university um <laughs> and uh, i actually dropped out of university early largely because i just didn't really want to go to university but uh, it seemed like the most likely prospect. Um, yeah, went to, to school, college, studied A-levels, um, went on to Coventry University to study computer science. I say, I was interested in computers. Uh, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with life. Um, I think probably if I could see, well, maybe I wouldn't be as interested in computers if I could see, because that interest was drawn by the fact that I had this amazing 
talking computer and I wanted to know more about it. But I think probably if I could see, I would have ended up on a gap year at that point and probably found some really exotic work and probably stuck at it for two or three years before I came back and, and settled and it would have turned into more than a gap year. But um, and actually, you know, I know blind people have done this, but I didn't have the confidence to do it. And I didn't at the time know anybody who'd done it. And it seemed like such a, a, a you know, it was a thing that, that blind people sort of didn't do. And, um, you know, I wasn't likely to find a job without a degree. I lived in Birmingham, but I still wasn't likely to find a job, you know, without a degree. And so it just seemed like, well, I mean, I, I don't really want to go, but I mean, you've sort of got to really, because it's the only way you're going to get anywhere in life. <laughs> And, and so then did you did you stay the course with the computer science at Coventry or are you saying you dropped you dropped out? Yeah, well, um, I, I learned Braille at school. Um, I was very proud to learn Braille at school and I find it very useful. Uh, you know, it's one of the most useful things I've learned is Braille along with uh, IT skills. But anyway, when I was at Coventry, um, I needed some mobility training around the site, which, you know, basically was somebody coming out and saying, well, you know, you know how to use a long cane, but here, here are the things that you need to do. You know, here are where, here, the, here are where the crossings are, here are where the, the landmarks are, you know, um, here's how to get from this building to this building kind of thing, you know, and basically just, just walk me around the campus a few times and show me uh, where everything was and then teach me the most your safest route to get there. So while all this was going on, um, that the person who taught me that was part time at Exel Grange School, which is a school for the blind uh, on the other side of Coventry, the north side of Coventry. And um, the funding for those mobility lessons ran out. And I was made aware at the time that the blind school at Exel Grange had a particularly bright mathematics students you know year, year six at the time at the top end of primary school possibly even in year five at the time but very good at maths and the maths teacher had just left and they didn't have the braille expertise required to teach this this very bright student how to do maths at the time wow. and um and i did have those expertise uh, uh not necessarily to teach but i had the braille expertise mm. having been taught them uh and so an arrangement was worked out where I went into the blind school and volunteered to uh, lend them my braille expertise in exchange for extra mobility lessons uh, because there was no funding available at the school and there was no funding available at the university. But, you know, it sort of just seemed to work out that reciprocal arrangement was a good idea. And uh, that reciprocal arrangement slowly sort of gradually sort of turned into a job. Uh, where you know funding did become available because the student went into secondary school and the amount of braille expertise increased and um, one thing led to another and I had to make a decision about whether I was going to keep the job at the school or carry on and get a degree and by that point I was feeling very disenchanted with the whole university system I didn't think I was going to go into a computer science career even if I did finish the degree my level of motivation for the degree was very low and I felt that perhaps even if I did get a degree it wouldn't be a very good one and my level of motivation for work and for the job was very high and so I just decided that you know given all of that and given that the very high level of unemployment in the blind community it's something like you know um 80 percent unemployment in the blind community That's finding shocking. a job was going to be difficult anyway yeah it, it's very very high levels of unemployment so I just decided look the best thing to do at this point in my life is to take the job, enjoy it. And then if it doesn't work out, then go back to university as a mature student. And so far, life's worked out enough that I haven't needed to go down the mature student route. And Matthew, that's fascinating. How, how then did you come to Torch? What was your connection with Torch? When did you first hear about Torch? And how did you end up working for Torch? Well, I first heard about Torch years and years ago uh, i think it had just moved to market harbour it was the early 2000s and um i wanted a copy of mission praise in braille and because I, I was singing in church choirs and perhaps we'll come on to that later on but i wanted a copy of mission praise in braille and i specifically needed mission praise one and mission praise two the original mission praise really slim volumes that were published you know as part of the, the billy graham movement I contacted RNIB or my mum contacted RNIB actually 
And they said, we can do Mission Praise, but we can't do that particular edition of Mission Praise. And have you tried this little organization called Torch Trust? They may be able to help. And um, so we did. We tried Torch Trust and Torch Trust could deliver the goods. They had Mission Praise 1 and Mission Praise 2 and they could send it out and it didn't cost an awful lot of money. Uh, so I got Mission Praise 1 and 2 in Braille. And that was the last I heard of Torch for a while. Um, <clears throat> basically until I was going through my old hymn book collection, working out, you know, what was worth keeping and what had got so flat that it was worth throwing away. And I saw in the front of Mission Praise, you know, transcribed by Torch Trust. And um, the job at Exxon was going well, but I could also sense that it was perhaps uh, coming to an end, that the student was about to leave. Mm -hmm. uh, there was not the the cohort coming through to maintain my workload so i thought well i'll have a look at this torch trust and see what they're about because clearly they do some good work you know uh, transcribing mission praise uh and i looked on the website and saw that there was a job opening in the sight loss friendly church team and i decided uh, it, it looked perfect uh, it looked like uh, you know work from home so i didn't have to leave coventry and i feel very at home in coventry so that was kind of a, a requirement for a new job it was uh, slightly better paid than what i was getting at exel although there were slightly more hours involved um working for a christian charity well i'm a christian so that seemed to fit um telling people about sight loss in the church which i've been doing organically whenever i've moved church and it all just seemed like a, a, a decent enough fit that it was worth applying and it was uh, it was worth getting an interview. So I, I got an interview and then ultimately got the job. And since then, I've been in the Sight Loss Friendly Church team, although my role has changed a little bit over time, you know, j just to keep up with developments in Sight Loss Friendly Church and the coronavirus and uh, the, the economic fallout of that and all of that sort of thing. Well, wow, that's amazing. And and. So you you were a Christian from very young. Did you grow up in a Christian family? What was your sort of journey into uh, into the Christian world? Yeah, my mum was more Christian than my dad. Uh, but <clears throat> yes, I grew up in a Christian family. Um, we went to the local Church of England parish church, which was walking distance from my house, uh, my childhood home, and very, very well equipped. It was a very nice old Victorian church. Uh, and it had, you know, a good organ and a good set of bells and uh, a very sort of traditional but very engaged congregation, um, which made it not feel traditional, even though it was. And um, yeah, I was baptised there, I think, as a baby. I can't really remember that. My brother and sister were both baptised there. And um, as faith does it sort of it comes and goes doesn't it and um or at least mine certainly has and i think my parents certainly has as well and as my parents faith came and went our church going habits came and went and you know um <clears throat> excuse me we would go maybe oh gosh goodness me you know two or three months without going to church and then one day my mum would wake up and say look we really need to go to church today and of course i'd say oh why you know i've got i've got used to not going thank you very much and uh, but but we went to church you know and on one of those sundays when we went to church there was a visiting organist uh the the, the regular church organist had uh, unbeknownst to us because we hadn't been going for a while had actually resigned he'd, he'd moved on to a new post and they were without an organist and they had a visiting organist this sunday who was uh, a, a proper organist, as in that the organist that we'd had before was a pianist who right. did a very good job, but actually wasn't particularly versatile. Um, that the new guy who they got in was a, a, a trained organist and played in cathedrals and things like that, and was making our organ uh, make noises that I'd never heard it make before. <laughs> and I was absolutely fascinated. I was probably about eight or nine at this point, and um, I had a chat with him afterwards, and I said, you know, can I? Play the organ and he said yeah you know go for it <laughs> so i i played the organ and he he said can you sing and so i sung him some stuff and he said yeah you should uh, you should join our choir you'll need to come to church every sunday uh, <laughs> and you'll need to come to practice every friday and my parents said i don't think we can commit to that and i said yes but i would like to commit to that and the church said well 
we'll make sure that he gets there and back, you know, so they, they arrange, I think my parents used to drop me off on a Friday evening and somebody used to give me a lift back. And uh, there were similar arrangements like that made on Sundays from time to time, and especially for special services, you know, midnight mass and things. And uh, so, yeah, I was then going to church every Sunday and singing every Sunday and uh, learning a lot about the faith through the music that I was singing. And uh, I think ultimately it was that that drew me towards confirmation and continuing as a Christian in adulthood. Wow. And, and Matthew, what is your sense of the difference that your faith has made to your life and your, your work now and the choices you make in life? Um, hmm. I don't really know. I think it's hard to describe my faith because it's not um, it's not something that I talk about a lot mm -hmm. and it's not something that I consciously feel at the at the moment and, and perhaps you know as it develops perhaps I'll feel it more um, but I don't wake up in the morning and think I'm a Christian and this is this is what's going to frame my day uh, I mean I, I wake up and pray but I mean I, you know that's sort of you know par for the course really um, I think what I do feel is a very strong sense that I'm not alone, mm -hmm. a very strong sense that uh, everything happens for a reason, that, that, that there is a plan and that I am uh, a part of that plan and that I don't need to worry because whatever the next part of that plan is, I'll fit in somehow. And I do have a very, very strong sense of that. And if something doesn't go right, um, I have a very strong sense that it will either go better tomorrow or I'll learn something very valuable from it. And uh, yeah, I, I think that that really underpins everything I do and, and leaves me generally feeling quite calm and not very stressed. Uh, you know, I very rarely wake up and think I've got no money in the bank. What am I going to do? Um, I quite often wake up with no money in the bank, but I don't worry about what I'm going to do about it because I know that it, it's all going to be sorted out by the, by the next time. Wow, that's amazing. That's that's actually really powerful, Matthew. I don't know if you if you realise just how um, inspiring that is. That that just that trust, that simple trust that actually everything is going to be all right, I suppose, is the uh, mm. take on it. Now, now, it sounds like music has been a really key thing for you. And, and um, one of the advantages I have is I can see that you have a shirt and tie on, which I have to say, I've not seen you in before. So um, d tell us a little bit about why you're wearing a shirt and tie. <laughs> Actually, I feel quite comfortable in a shirt and tie, but I also feel quite comfortable in, you know, jeans and a t-shirt and, and whatever else. And uh, I feel like a shirt and tie doesn't have impact if you wear it every day so i tend to wear it for, <laughs> yeah, for special occasions um but yeah uh, i i as an adult i'm now in the lay clerks at coventry cathedral uh so you know continuing my choral practice if you like uh so i sing in the tenor section of the cathedral choir uh so that there's boys and girls that sing soprano and then ladies that sing alto and then the men sing tenor and bass so we're a very progressive cathedral because we have female altos and we have a female top line, although I think most cathedrals have a female top line now. But anyway, uh, yeah, I sing in the Lay Clarks and this has been really challenging throughout COVID-19. Um, there are real challenges with blind people getting access to music and there are real challenges with everybody actually being allowed to sing at the moment because of the pandemic. And certainly during the first lockdown, there were virtual choirs and things like that. And uh, I just wasn't a part of any of it. I was invited to be a part of it, but the, the repertoire was having to be chosen at such short notice. Uh, and I just, I just couldn't keep up at all. Mm -hmm. So I, I went a long period of time without singing, but in the second lockdown, we're doing things slightly differently and we are uh, championing live music wherever we can champion live music. And that means that the music that we're singing has to be quite simple at the moment because I, I don't know if it's government guidance or Church of England guidance or local guidance, but some sort of guidance says that we are only allowed to have one singer at a time. Uh, so effectively one singer per service. Um, and there aren't many of us who actually want to do this. Uh, so those of us who do want to do it go on a rotor and periodically 
you know, get a phone call from the director of music to say, would you be able to sing in two or three weeks time? And uh, this has been really interesting for me. Uh, singing solo in a cathedral has been quite daunting, uh, but it, it's also been a lot of fun. And it's actually, uh, it, we have a, a relatively new director of music who's obviously never worked with a blind person before and certainly never worked with me before. Um, and sort of, you know, she she came to the cathedral as assistant director of music, but, you know, came in as director of music during the pandemic. So we haven't really had a great deal of time to actually sit down and go, well, what, what can I do? What can't I do? Mm. Whereas now that I've been given the opportunity to sing solo, we've really been able to sit down and work out, okay, what do you need in order to do this job? And she's been really accommodating it, you know, making sure that I do have enough notice and I do have the repertoire. And if I can't get the repertoire, finding repertoire that I have got, and you know buying in extra music sometimes to accommodate and um as we record this it's ash wednesday today and it's my turn by coincidence uh, on the rotor to sing the ash wednesday service at the cathedral so i'm actually dressed up as once we're finished i shall head out to the cathedral and practice for the service and then sing the service uh as a solo in you know to a webcam uh, and then the congregation will watch online Wow, that's amazing. And, and what a brilliant thing to do. And I think that um, your director of music's question was really good. What, what can we do to make this work for you? How, how do we make this work? That, that's a, that seems to me to be a great, um, a great question to ask. Mm. Um, Matthew, a couple, of, um, a couple of questions. I'm just intrigued, you know, having, having worked with you a bit over the like, recent months and, and seen just how, um, you know, you navigate life so brilliantly. Um, tell me a little bit about a cane. I think a cane is the right word, isn't it? Um, a a cane is the right word. I, 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 I'm not <laughs> precious, but I mean, that is the word. I think I called it a stick the other day and uh, realised I'd made a mistake. Um, <laughs> so, so tell me a little bit about what's it like to use a cane to get around? And, and one of, um, I am a very visual person and I, I do diagrams and maps and my family calls me the, um, the family sat nav because I just seem to be able to get around places. Do you have a kind of map in your head of the places you go and how, how does that work for you? Yeah, so this is a very personal question and you could ask 10 blind people this question and get 10 answers. And actually, um, I personally don't see mobility as one of my greatest strengths. I mean, I can do it and, and I can get around and I can go you know, wherever I want to go and it doesn't hold me back. But, you know, I know blind people who are much better at this sort of thing than I am. But um, what's it like? I mean, I don't really know how to answer the question because, it, again, it's normal. I was taught to use a cane when I was yeah. just, you know, I, I learned to walk. And then a couple of years later, I was taught to use a cane. So I've been using a cane since I was sort of, three, four sort of age, mm. um, a very small cane back in those days. <laughs> and look, I didn't enjoy it because at the same time I was taught to use a cane, I was also taught to uh, protect my you know, upper body protection, it was called. So you, you'd walk with your hand out in front of your face to stop you from bumping into things and um, to help you stay in a straight line, particularly at, at a young age, um, you know, trail the wall with the back of your hand and I used to quite enjoy doing that. And um, I used to, you know, all the way up to the end of secondary school, I used to walk around secondary school just with a hand in front of my face, trailing the wall. And, um, and that was perfectly fine. I didn't see why I should use a cane when that was getting me around. And then I tried to walk around outside a bit and realized that trailing the walls of, you know, open shop doors and street furniture and one thing or another, you know, that was just not going to happen. And also the number of people who were around, the number of people who I'd end up bumping into if I didn't have a cane was just so high that I just thought, no, this has got to change. So I always knew that I could use a cane. I just didn't particularly want to. And um, so I, I started using the cane a bit more and uh you know well it was basically the only way that I was going to be able to navigate unless I got a dog and at the time I was actually scared of dogs uh, so that was a pretty strong disincentive for getting a guide dog I didn't want one I mean look I've since I've got friends who've grown up and had guide dogs and had to sort of get used to them and actually quite like dogs now but 
no, I was absolutely terrified of them. I did not want a guide dog. Um, I'd do anything not to have one. Uh, and, and even now, I mean, I, I, you know, the idea of a guide dog is quite nice, you know, but you've got to pick up after them. You've got to mm. free run them. You know, we were in, you know, minus temperatures last week. Mm. And all I really wanted to do was stay in the house and keep warm. And if I'd had a dog, that wouldn't have been an option. You know, I'd have had to take the dog out for a run. Um, and I, I don't really like that idea. So, you know, the, the cane is, is the way to do it. And I, I just, I don't know, um, was have just been incentivized to keep using it because if I don't use it, then I'm not going to get about. And um, there were some pretty strong incentives when I was a student. I, I was at living in university halls. I had a friend who actually lived the other side of the city. And as a blind person, we get free bus travel. So I could get to my friend's house on the bus for free if I could be bothered to use my cane to walk down to the bus stop. But if I couldn't be bothered to use my cane to walk down to the bus stop, I was going to have to pay £10 each way in a taxi. Mm. As a student, that's a pretty big incentive. You know, you, you could either uh, use your cane or spend 20 quid. Well, I'm going to use my cane. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> and, and I understand from comments you've made previously that you, um, you live on your own. Um, I do, yes. Again, Tell me what are some of the biggest challenges about that? How do you how do you cook? What's the um, what, what, how does it work living on your own as a blind person? Yeah, <laughs> reluctantly, um, <laughs> I would love nothing more than you know to have all the money in the world and pay a chef or something to come <laughs> and cook for me. Uh, you know, no, I, very 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 reluctantly. Uh, but yeah, I was taught to cook. Salary, I don't think. When you know, <laughs> when I when I was at college in particular, I went to the Royal National College down at Hereford, and uh, it was a boarding college, and that gave us plenty of opportunity to be taught formally how to cook, mm. um, and it also I I, um, I was at with with peers who either enjoyed cooking or were also learning to cook or had learnt to cook previously, and so there was in eno this enormous bank of knowledge and actually I learned more from my peers than I did from mm. formal lessons so I learned to cook very basic meals like pasta and sauce mm. um spaghetti bolognese um I think I just about managed a cottage pie by the time I left <laughs> Hereford uh, which isn't actually all that basic now I look back at it but you know it was cooked in a very basic way and I went through university sort of cooking these very basic meals, you know, jacket potatoes, because uh, they, they were nice and simple. And then I realized that I was starting to put on some weight because actually what I was cooking, uh, although, you know, it, it was nice, it wasn't particularly healthy um, because, you know, spaghetti bolognese it was basically just mince and pasta sauce and spaghetti there was there was not very much veg in it and things like that and, and so this wasn't happening and so anyway out of necessity more than anything else I started to very reluctantly start to think well actually look um if I can put this in a pan and cook it and I can put this in a pan and cook it what would happen if I put them both in a pan together and and cook them at the same time and there were some absolutely terrible outcomes <laughs> of food that really didn't taste very nice but there were also some rather nice outcomes of recipes that actually I still cook and I have no idea what to call them because <laughs> they're not officially, you know, recognized recipes, but they work. And, um, and out of that grew an appreciation, it, if not an enjoyment, I don't particularly enjoy doing it, but I do understand the concept of how to do it. I understand that, you know, um, you can put all this stuff in a pan and it'll work, but you don't want to put this with it because, you know, you don't want to put mushrooms in with it because mushrooms have flavor uh, and, and the flavor of the mushroom will get into the rest of the vegetables. So if you want to do mushrooms, you really want to fry them up separately and add them afterwards. And, you know, so I, I learned uh, things like that just by doing really, although the, the basic skills of, uh, you know, uh, cooking on gas, which you would think isn't very safe, but actually cooking on gas is brilliant because you can hear when the gas is on and when the gas is off, it cools down very quickly. So you don't burn yourself. Um, you know, learning to tell if something's cooked by 
touch or by temperature. I have a talking food thermometer uh, and I can put that in you know, put the probe in something to tell if it's cooked. And, and all of those very basic skills I learned while I was at Hereford, but actually recipes and things I've just devised over the years. Yeah. yeah. That's fascinating. I have so much respect for you, Matthew. Um, just to finish with, I wonder if there are any particular things that you would like to say to me um, as, as a sighted person who we interact work-wise. Um, but what are the things that um, maybe that I do that kind of frustrate you or, you know, have you got any kind of words of wisdom for me in, in how best to... Uh, to speak about blindness and sight loss, how to, how to uh, you know, make your life um, as, as rich and easy as it can be to kind of not fall into some traps and faux pas that sighted people make. And anything that comes to mind on that front? I think actually you're doing the right things. And I, I don't really, nothing really comes to mind other than keep doing what you're doing. I know that there are a lot of chief executives in very high profile, what I would call blindness organizations, what the industry would probably call sight loss organizations who are in the organization for, you know, very well-meaning charitable purposes, but impose their own opinion of, of what sight loss means and actually generally that opinion is that sight loss is so debilitating that we can't do anything and so there's, there's, there's this mentality in the sector of you know oh the poor blind person we must help them whereas actually the, the mentality that i want is we must empower them and there's a difference between the two uh, and there's a that there's a frustration for me that the sector as a whole has this mentality uh, that you know there's a lot of people that are dependent upon the blindness sector because it's easier for them to stay dependent upon the blind sector than to learn the skills not to depend on it anymore. So, you know, that, that you, you have societies that do lots of social trips and things like that. And look, social trips are helpful. Uh, you know, it's very helpful. It's very useful. It's very fulfilling to socialize with other blind people um, in a, in a secular context and a sacred context, you know, to actually talk about these very real issues that only we as blind people have and, and will really properly understand. So I'm not for a moment saying that we shouldn't have social groups, but there are people for whom the social groups are the be all and end all. And actually, I don't think that's healthy either. I think, you know, we, we really need to be teaching people to, you know, to be empowered, mm -hmm. to be part of the blind world, but also to be part of the real world uh, mm -hmm. or the, the sighted world, if you like. And uh, I, I don't think that happens enough. I think people are too too quick to help and too slow to empower. But I think from what I've seen of, of you, you know, through these Sight Loss 101 things and through other things that have been happening at Torch, I don't feel like that's happening at Torch at the moment. Good. Well, keep me keep me honest with that one, Matthew. Keep keep on me about it because um, one of the one of the things I've learned over the last few months is just how gifted and competent so many folk with with blindness and, and with living with sight loss are and and just you know recognizing those gifts and wanting to say how can we help the, the world benefit from um, from all that you guys have to offer so Matthew thank you for this thank you for opening up for um, telling us about your um, your life in this way and and I hope the singing goes fantastically today. Um, I'm, you've sent me the link for it, so I'm looking forward to listening. So thank you, Matthew. Bless you. Well, thank you, Tim. It's been a real pleasure being in the conversation. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us in Sight Loss 101. For more information on Torch, call 01858 438260